Okay, and um, I'm a physicist, so no, nobody's perfect. And <laughs> what I want to tell you today, if I had just one message, is that energy is not that simple. People do consider that, okay, we know what is energy. And days after days, years after years, as a physicist, I do believe that energy is really something subtle. Okay, so uh, I have, to, in fact, two talks. I'm sorry we have the sun, so it's nice, but we, you cannot see so many things. Well, there are different forms of energy that you probably know. Here you've got water that is going to run on a turbine, and this is mechanical energy. This is also mechanical energy. Here you produce some electricity, then you transfer mechanical energy into electromagnetic energy. So this is electricity another form of energy, and then you can go, well, of course, it's just an image, okay? You can go to a battery, and inside the battery, it's another kind of energy, which is chemical energy. Well, so we are living in a world where energy can exist in different forms, mechanical, chemical, electrochemical, pneumatic, and also electric. Well, this is really simple, and energy is something which is conserved. That is really important. We will see in the second talk that not everything is conserved in physics. Okay, and you can do this, the budget of the potential of energy and then the kinetic energy, which has to do with the velocity of the matter. And you say that, okay, I get exactly the same amount of kinetic energy as I had as a potential energy. Well, and then if there's no loss, then at the end, I get here the same amount of energy that I had before. Okay, life is simple. Well, in fact, we are living in a real world. Then everything is in interaction. Nothing is isolated. And since, since nothing is isolated, every time you've got a protocol where energy is involved, then the fraction of this energy goes to the universe. Some people would say that you have to pay a certain amount of entropy. I will go back to this term, which is mi very misleading, okay? But in every process, here you've got friction that gives you heat. Here you've got friction also. And here, when you charge the battery, if you charge too, quick, too quickly the battery, then the battery will warm. And then you will lose a fraction of energy as heat. So there are two kinds of energy that we can consider. One is heat, warming, global warming, okay? And one is what we call work, okay? Mechanical work, when you ride your bicycle, okay? Or here in a car. <laughs> and there's something that we can define, which is the efficiency of a process. For example, here you've got a car engine, and here a certain amount of gasoline, 100%. And the question is, how many, what is the quantity that I can get as a mechanical energy for my car, for running my car? And you see that the budget is not so good. Here you lose 40, you lose 30, 5. Here you have to take 5 and consider that there's no loss, get 5 for the battery. And at the end of the day, you just, you only get 20%. Here it's really important, and we'll go back to that. Well, one may say, you mean that when I put some gasoline, only 20% is used as mechanical energy and the rest is heat for the birds? The answer is yes. So the first lesson is that it's really difficult to manage energy without any loss. Okay, and here especially, because the energy we, uh, that we use at first is used from this kind of energy, which is chemical energy, you burn the fuel, and then you get mechanical energy. The second lesson is when you see a process, whatever is the process, energetical process, where you see that the efficiency is not really good, okay? Pretty bad efficiency. Don't consider that the process is bad. Maybe there's other things to learn from. And we will see that from life, we can learn a lot with this kind of low efficiency processes. How can you describe energy? Here I propose you two 
definitions. A definition of Richard Feynman, Nobel Prize in Physics, and says that there is something, a certain quantity, that you can measure, which is very, really important. You can measure it. You can measure energy. Okay? There is something that, which, that you can measure which is conserved when something occurs. Well, it's a pretty simple uh, definition. When something occurs somewhere in the universe, then there's a way to um, measure what happens, and this measurement and the unity of this is energy. There is another definition from Amy Noether, and you've got a nice photo of Amy Noether smiling, smiling to us. Okay, Amy Noether in 1918 wrote a famous theorems, which are called Noether theorems, which is a kind of aesthetic in physics. I have to say that it's really, really beautiful. What does she say? She said that when you've got a kind of symmetry through the space or through the, of, through the time, then in front of this symmetry, there is something which is conserved. Okay. So imagine a, a symmetry of a translation over time. And one of this symmetry is the fact that the laws of physics are valid today, tomorrow, but they were yesterday. Okay? And this is a translation over time. And the laws of, of, of physics are the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And from this symmetry in the space, Emil Ather says, there is something which is conserved. And I call energy this thing. You may say that. Well, this is, this is strange. This is not the same definition. Well, look. Just consider, if you want to buy something, you use money, dollar, euros, you want what you want, okay? During the time you are buying something, you expect that your money keeps the same value. It can change, okay? But not during uh, the transaction. Otherwise, you cannot do the transaction, okay, for everyone. Well, it's the same with physics. If you measure something with physics, with the laws of physics, and if the laws of physics are changing over time, then you cannot measure anything. You cannot measure energy. So you see that the, the, the validity of the laws of energy of, of physics over time is the same as saying energy should be conserved. Energy as a money, a money for quantifying the transaction. What is this transaction? The transaction is the transformation, transformations of the matter in our uh, planet, so, or in the universe. Every time me or you or uh, who you want are modifying anything in terms of modifying matter, building something, destroying something, whatever, okay, then this transformation of the matter has to do with a given amount of energy. So energy is the money, clearly as an economical term, is the money which, uh, with which you, are, you, may, you can measure the transformations of the matter. So you see, this is a very, very, very fundamental definition, which has very strong backgrounds, and you see that there are uh, also extension in an, economi an economical way of thinking things. Okay? And you may say, well, what is Anthropocene? What is it? For a physicist, it's the time where people were able to, to, to catch sufficient uh, amount of energy in order to transform the matter of the planet at the scale of the planet. That's a definition. Well, these are definitions of the units, so I won't take so much time for that. I will leave you the slides. A joule, one joule is the the measurement of the energy. If you take one joule, if you consider one joule of energy, and this is used for one second, you divide the one joule by one second, and then that what you get is power, which is measured in watt. Okay. Well, 
the question is, let's have an order of magnitude. Let's imagine that I take six bottles of one and a half liter on the floor. I take them and I put a two meter eye, okay? So you see that's pretty nice effort. Well, and I do, add, I, I do that in one second. You can do the calculation. The result is the, the effort and the power, I, the mechanical power I have to provide is 200 watt. So you see, it's a pretty nice effort, okay? If you consider the food that you eat every day and say, okay, this is my energy and that helps me to live during 24 hours, then you can divide the, the amount of energy by the duration and get your average power. And the result is more or less 130 watt in average. Considering someone of 65 kilograms, okay, then it's 2 watts per kilogram. So this is the amount of energy that, uh, the amount of power, sorry, that a mammal, as you and me, okay, uh, can produce. Well, okay, so a guy who is riding his bicycle in the Tour de France and he's providing 450 watts, the only question you have to ask is, what is he drinking? Okay, not water, surely not. Okay, well, this is horsepower. Horsepower, or steam, or horse uh, steam, steam power, it's here 736 watts. Is this an, uh, a unit? Um, done by the physicists? The, the answer is not. It's a unit, it's a fiscal unit. That's, well, it's a term, okay. Why? Because before the apparition of steam engines during the 80s, okay, then the way you could use uh, a mine with coal, the problem is that there's a lot of water okay, inside. You have to remove the water. And people were using horses, okay? And then the inspector came and says, okay, you've got two horses, so the tax is this one, proportional to the number of horses. And one day the guy come and see a steam engine. There's no more horse. Well, no problem, this guy is clever. And he asked the CEO, okay, how many horses does this engine replace? And the guy says, well, five horses. Okay, then the tax is five for five horses. So this is a fiscal, uh, fiscal um, unit at first. But of course, it's also a physical unit. Here, you can see in this field, okay, this engine is run by horses. And if you, ca you can comb them, more or less, they are 50. So this engine power is 50 horses. Today, a car, an average car, not a Ferrari, but an average car is 100 horses. Here it's only 50. You see? And ask yourself, well, in this tree, in the history, does uh, Charles Quint or Cleopatra or other emperors, emperors, sorry, none, no, um, none of them had 100 horses. Not on them, okay? And today, everyone can have such um, a luxury a solution for the transportation. So you can see that the problem, what is the problem for us? The problem is our average power is 130 watt, okay? The biological power. And in fact, what we are using as a standard power for living as we are living is few uh, few kilowatts more close to 10 than close to 1 okay so there are between one and two orders of magnitude of difference between our biological situation and our real so, uh, situation and that's the problem for the transition okay the problem for the transition is not the question of reducing of 10% or 20%. Okay? 
we are completely um, disencastrated. Dis un unembedded, uh, not, not embedded. Not embedded, okay. And it's also, in some way, the, the, the title of the book of Karl Polanyi, the, um, the Great Transformation, and the fact that we have to be uh, embedded. embedded in the system. And from an uh, energy uh, point of view, we are not. We are clearly not. So we are miles away from our biological uh, situation. Okay. Um, something interesting is to see that if you consider the org or the grease or um, the gasoline or butter or whatever you want, uh, like fat, then the amount of energy is more or less the same, it's 35 uh, megawatt per liter. And this is really, really important. And this value, 35 mega, megajoule, sorry, per liter, it's a huge amount of energy. That means that if you consider gasoline or other fossil energy, the fossil energy have a very, very, very large density of energy. Okay? And this is something that we usually we don't take care about. But if you consider electricity, a battery, what is the density of energy inside a battery? Well, it's only 0.5% of such density. So again, this is a problem for us. We are miles away. We consider that fossil energy, okay, well, it's pretty, pretty efficient, right? No, it's not pretty efficient. It is really, really efficient. It's such a density, there's no, there's no comparison. Well, now, imagine that you've got a certain amount of energy, which is one kilowatt during one hour. So it's one kilowatt, kilowatt hour, okay. What can you do with such an amount of energy? You can watch the TV during a few hours. You can... Uh, play your PlayStation during one day, you have your, your fridge for one day, or the furnace for one hour, or the shower for three minutes. Three minutes. The reason is that warming the water costs a lot of energy. So this is a location where you can reduce your consumption. I don't, li I don't like this conclusion, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> but the fact is, okay, the shower costs a lot of energy. Okay, so you have different things of ADSL, eight hours, okay. If you've got um, an electrical smart, it's only two kilometers. You see? Okay. Well, now let's consider uh, this woman, Svetlana Podobedova, at the Olympic Games in... <coughs> Uh, nine years ago in London, 160, 161 kg at two meter in four seconds. What is the average power? Well, let us say 80, uh, one, uh, 800 watts. It's more than the horse. <laughs> but the difference is that this is more than a horse, but during four seconds. Okay? It's kind of explosive uh, job, right? There's another one. Well, Ishan Bolt, and you see this very nice picture. It's an, at the end of the race and he's smiling so nicely. Well, okay, so he's a nice guy, 94 kilograms, and from the starting, starting block, from zero, zero um, meter per second to seven meter per second in a fraction of, of second, 0.9 second. Well, what is the power of Yushan Bolt? I remind you that 10 kilograms in one second, okay, 200 watts, okay? And here, 2060, 2060. This is the maximum. This is the maximum for the mammals we are, okay, close to, well, let's say 3,000, but not more. And this is during less than one second, okay? So, in summary, as you are, 
and as I am, more or less, 130 watt. Okay? A correct effort, 200. Well, a very huge effort for you and for, and for me, let us say, 400. Okay? And this, not, absolutely not possible if you are not trained to do that and really, really hardly trained. And here, you are still below what you are currently uses, using as a, uh, average power for your living. I mean, for the transportation and the food that is coming by boat, by plane and whatever, okay? You do the average power and this is more than that. It's seven minutes of shower, yes. <laughs> okay, now let's compare a gasoline car and an um, electrical car. Well, Tesla S. Well, with gasoline, 40 liter, the amount of energy, well, 378 kilowatt hour. Autonomy, 660 kilo, kilometer, and how long for refilling completely your car, which in average is one minute. Okay? With that, you can calculate the average power you need because you know the amount of energy and you know the time, so you can, dif you can do the, di the, the division of this amount of energy divided by the time you need to put this energy, and you've got the average power of the gasoline flux, okay? And you see that it's absolutely enormous, 34 megawatt, 34 megawatt. 100 megawatt is 10% of a nuclear power. This, well, when you, when you, You've got, you've got your gasoline, okay? This is chemical energy. And you, got, you are going to transfer this chemical energy into your car, okay? And what is the, the equivalent power? I mean, you can, you, if you have um, electricity, okay? And you say, I've got such amount of electricity in joule. And I want to refill my electrical battery. Then I need some electrical current. And I can consider with my, elect my electrons going the amount of power which is going through the wire. Okay? And here's the same through the tube. This is liquid, okay? But this is energy. And what is the amount of power? So the amount of energy per unit time. And here you see that the, po the equivalent power is absolutely uh, enormous. Okay. If you consider electrical car, then the capacity of the battery is 100, so you see that it's, uh, it's much less, but, but, but from the electricity you may use close to 1% of your electricity into mechanical power, because it is not an uh, heat engine. You don't have to burn the, the gasoline. You, jet, do, you directly use an amount of energy which is a very high quality, we are going to do that, to talk about that, and then you use this high quality to produce high quality energy, which is mechanical work, okay? On the first uh, example, you have the gasoline that you have to, to burn, and this is less quality, and only a fraction of that can be used. And in fact, the fraction is <coughs> uh, only 20% uh, uh, or 20, 20, 25. But the difference, the difference is when you want to refill your car here, it costs you a very large amount of time. Okay. That's because, because electricity is not so dense. The density of electricity is low. So the way you can refill your battery is also something which is, is uh, limited. And maximal power is only 124 kilowatts. But if you do that, you will warm a lot, a lot your battery. And then you will degrade that. Okay. Okay, this is a first, a first look to energy. Well, two questions. The first one is, do you have any comment or any question before I start the second part? 
Don't hesitate, I'm only physicist. Okay, so I'll repeat the question. You said that about 20% of gasoline goes into power in the car and electric uh, energy is more efficient. Uh, what would be the percentage? With electrical uh, with energy? With electric energy, yeah. Well, can, it depends of the, of the quality of the motor, of the electrical motors you've got. But if you consider a drone, for example, uh, there are a special engines which are called brushless and their efficiency is close to 95%, so it, it's, a, it's a lot, it's a lot. Like if we take um, an electric vehicle, taking that Tesla, for example? Well, of course, if you've got a very high, this, this is my second talk anyway, but let's start it, thank you for your question. Uh, of course, if you've got energy of very good quality, then what you can do with that is produce work directly. But if your energy is not available in a good quality, and I will give you examples. So for now, for you, it's a little bit, a little bit it's a kind of smog. Anyway, we'll clear that. Then, if you've got um, low quality, then you have to, to, to go through a process with eating, then you've got only a fraction. That's what we call thermodynamics. Thank you. Other question? No? Yeah. It isn't really okay. A question is something I didn't really understand. I understand how you calculate it for energy for normal car, but like for battery and electric, I, 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 electricity, I didn't really understand uh, how, how you calculate the energy for uh, electric... Uh, battery? Battery. Yeah. So with your... It was just to remind me that it's five o'clock. Uh, in a, inside the battery, your battery is, for example, 12 volt, okay? And the, um, the volume of your battery is equivalent to a given volume of charge, electrical charge. Um, briefly, uh, the amount of, uh, of electrons you can store into, okay? And electrons is a charge, okay? This charge uh, as a unit, which is a coulomb. And if you multiply the volt times the coulomb, then what you get um, is uh, homogeneous to an energy. So we can directly say, okay, with a given battery, uh, we have a certain amount of energy. When you are um, in a market where, you can, where there's a place for um, devices for cars, you can also buy your battery and have a look to the batteries and you will see the, the capacity of the battery, which is not in, um, in joule, it's written in um, ampere, um, volt ampere hour. But if you multiply volt and ampere, you get some watt. Multiplied by hours, but you translate into seconds, then you get joule. So at the end of the day, it's the same. When you buy your, bat your battery, what you buy is a certain, um, uh, a certain amount of energy that you can use and refill, of course. Okay? No other question? Well, well, if you don't have any question, then I have a question. Imagine you have to buy some iron, okay? And uh, someone says you, you want to buy one ton of, of iron. Okay, because you are want to build things. And someone tells you that you can buy one ton of dust of iron, okay, like um, anta, okay, so, okay, some dust of iron, but there's one ton and the quality of the iron is okay, uh, no rust, okay. Or you can buy some tubes of iron, the same amount of matter, okay, one ton of iron. Does the price, is the price the same for, the, for both? Obviously not, okay? But the quantities are the same, okay? 
Well, so there's something missing. For economy, there's something missing, okay? And for the physicists, there's also something missing. I have to be able to distinguish what is the difference from this and this. It's the same matter, iron, and the same amount, wanton. So the quantities are the same. But the quality of the product is not the same. You agree with that? So I use the word quality. So you're okay for this definition of the quality. Okay? The iron is not in the same form, and the difference of, of form, I call it quality. Well, welcome in thermodynamics. <laughs> because in thermodynamics, what we do is that we consider not only quantities, because we miss something. We also need quality. And you know, every, everyone, who, who never heard about entropy? All of you, one day, at least, heard about, with, about entropy. Probably what you heard was completely stupid. <laughs> anyway, the big, uh, the very famous physicist, uh, John von Neumann, a uh, very, very, very uh, important guy, uh, in the middle of the last century said if someone says that he knows what is entropy this person is a liar nobody knows what is really entropy okay but you know what is entropy entropy is the measurement of the quality it's another word to say okay I can distinguish in between these two uh, p possible um, iron solutions, okay? What is different is the quality. So quality for us, and for me too, quality is another word for entropy. The point is that with entropy, you don't know what you are talking about. With quality, you are beginning to know what you are talking about, right? So let's go with thermodynamics. Well. Why should we do thermodynamics? If you ask uh, students, uh, the second year of the university, they start to learn thermodynamics, the answer is because we are forced to do that. <laughs> because thermodynamics is usually something difficult. Well, and indeed it is difficult. The math for thermodynamics are not, but the concepts are. That's why. I went through quality, okay? So you could not see that it fight it's subtle, but here we are, so let's continue. Well, imagine you've got your car. Well, and you need a certain amount of energy. This is what I call the first principle, the first law of thermodynamics. What tells me the first law of thermodynamics? It tells me what Amy Noether said, energy is conserved, okay? And more precisely, energy is conserved and energy can exist in the form of work or heat, okay? This is the first law of thermodynamics. So the first law of thermodynamics is the law that deals with quantities. What is the amount of energy I have? What is the amount of matter I have? But I don't care about the quality. Now, well, with this amount of gasoline, what can you do? Well, you can drive slowly, okay, with no, um, no, um, no uh, violent accelerations, okay, then the consumption of your car is pretty good, and then you will use your car for a long, long, long trip. Okay? Or you can decide to use your energy in another way, running your car very, very fast. So, another definition of the, what we will call the second law of thermodynamics is the way you are using energy does matter. It's very important. For a given amount of energy, the way you are going to use it 
will uh, give you the possibility to do a lot or to, s to send a lot of heat into the rest of the universe. This is another definition of the second law, second law of thermodynamics. So, if we put things together, first law of thermodynamics, energy and matter are conserved. Okay, on our planet, the quantity of matter is conserved. Okay, we don't exchange with other planets. Okay, so our planet is not isolated because we receive energy from the sun, but our planet is closed. And the second law, if energy and or matter, it depends the process we are dealing with, if energy and or matter can be dispersed, okay, sprayed in uh, degrees of freedom, then they will do. What does that mean? That means that thermodynamic deals with the fact that the system is not isolated in the universe, but we are, we are in connection with the rest of the universe. Imagine that I've got one glass of gasoline. I put the gasoline on the floor and I burn it. What I get is only heat, okay? No production of any work, okay? You don't move anything, just produce heat. Imagine that you take the same glass of gasoline and you put inside a car engine and you burn it inside the car engine. Then you know that this time you produce, you will produce heat, okay? On both, the amount of energy which is, um, which is given by the combustion is the same, okay? But inside the engine, what you have done, yeah, that is that you have first frustrated some degrees of freedom. Then this energy has to follow a given path. And the, the result is that it produces a certain fraction of work. On the first case, you just burn it and you leave this gasoline burning going into contact with all the molecules of, uh, of the surrounding, okay? And there are many, 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 and each, mo each molecule is a degree of freedom. Then you see that this energy which will go very quickly and uh, spread over, uh, over all the molecules of the atmosphere. You see that? So you, can, you see that when you burn something, you can frustrate the system in order not to leave him going to all the degrees of freedom, and then you produce some work. But of course you can understand that you, can, you cannot frustrate all the degrees of freedom. Okay? Then to answer your question, you see that burning gasoline can produce some work but you will never reach 100%. It's not possible. It's absolutely not possible. Okay. Well, the guy who did the, jo who did the job first is Sadi Kano. Sadi Kano wrote in 1824 um, a short book, a very short book, and nobody read it. And in fact, um, in France, almost nobody took care about that. Because in France, we don't care about technology. We take care of science. So steam engine was something for the British, not for the French. Okay? Really? Okay? And the Academy, the Academy des Sciences in France, if you look to the book written by Arago, you can find them at the National li uh, Library. You just uh, type on the web Gallica and you can read that. And you will see that the question, they were, they were very, very famous and interesting scientific questions. But in France, nobody really cares about uh, steam engines. In UK, a lot, a lot at that time, okay? And the first who really knew, understood the importance of the work of Sadikano was a British, at that time, a British, you can imagine. So, and Carl, and uh, uh, the guy was William Thompson, later named uh, Lord Kelvin. 
and he went into Paris to learn thermodynamics, the beginning of thermodynamics. And he, he tried to find the book of Carnot. Then he was, he was along the river side and asked the bookseller that you can see the close to Notre Dame, for example. And he asked for this, this book and he could not find it. Well, okay, I don't, I'm go not going to go into um, all the story, but well, at the end of the second part of the 19th century, Lord Kelvin said, okay, the first guy who really understood what is the problem with thermodynamics, what is the problem with um, explaining how steam engine works, was Sadi Carnot, okay, British. And the second one was Rudolf, uh, Rudolf uh, Clausius, okay, so German. Well, not really French people. Anyway, that's life. Carnot did this job. He was 20, I think it was, he was 25 years old. And what is the problem of this? Well, the problem at the time of Carnot was, well, I've got some heat coming from a hot source with steam, okay? I've got some steam coming, running a turbine, okay? And then this steam goes down into something which is cold, okay? And at that time, people considered that heat were the fluid. It was the fluid that people called caloric. And caloric was considered to be a fluid. And every part of matter contained a given amount of caloric. And the proof is that it, I, if I take it and I, I press it, I can see it warms. So there is heat inside. It can sound very um, basic or stupid, but it, it was not. And, okay, what was the problem? When you say that, well, the solution of the problem is in a fluid which is caloric, which is the most known fluid you know. Tell me. Water. Okay? If you see water going from one side to another side, water is conserved. Well, okay? So people had to consider that water, that the caloric was conserved. But if caloric is conserved, what is the production of work? Where does, where does it come from? And people could not explain that. And the problem with the fact that you cannot explain, you cannot consider a fluid which is not conserved. You know the name of this fluid which is not conserved? Fluid, well, more or less, entropy. Entropy is not conserved. But at that time, nobody uh, knew that. And even Carnot never talked about entropy. He talked about caloric, and he said, well, there's a problem with the conservation of caloric, for sure. Well, question. What can you see on this picture? Do you see a duck? Who see, who see a duck? Okay. Well, other people, can you see a rabbit? Okay. Can you see a rabbit and a duck? <laughs> Imagine that you are living in a planet where there's no duck. When you see this picture, but there's, there, there are rabbits. When you see this picture, you will only see rabbits, a rabbit, okay? Because you don't know what is a duck. And that's the problem with Carnot. Carnot faced a problem of a fluid. Nobody knew about a fluid which, is, which can be non-conserved. And the point is that with entropy, you have to consider something which is going through the system and is not conserved. And you can see how huge is the step made by, Car by Carnot, okay? Carnot imagined in a planet where there are only rabbits that, well, maybe we can imagine a duck. Well, this comes from Wingenstein, if you, if you wish, uh, if you want to know exactly where this picture comes from uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein. Okay, now let's go into thermodynamics and say, well, if there is two laws of thermodynamics, the first one with the quantities and the second one with the qualities, these are laws of thermodynamics, of physics, so nobody can avoid them, especially nature. So during the evolution, well, nature has to do with these two constraints. You cannot use more energy than what you get, and the way you are using your energy, it does matter. 
Well, okay. So let us imagine here three different animals. Um, here you've got a sloth. That's the name. Okay. Well, um, I just uh, show you a sloth in a few seconds. I do the sloth. Does it? Do I like a sloth? No. Yes. Okay. Well, a sloth never move fast. It cannot. It cannot do that. Why? Because a sloth just eats some um, eucalyptus leaves, which is, in terms of chemical energy as nutrient, is very, very, very low nutrient. Okay? If you want to be to test uh, what is the life of a sloth, you just take the tea bags and you eat tea bags during two weeks and come back and we, are, we will talk about how is the life of the sloth. Okay? Well, and you can see that, well, Nature is really, really efficient, really efficient, because this animal just uses a very small part of nutrients. It does not need so much energy. Wow, nature is really, really nice things. Okay, let's imagine this mammal here, the whale. Okay, this is a mammal as me and you. So, this animal is uh, as um, a temperature of more or less 37 degrees Celsius, as me, as you and me, okay? But in the ocean, the temperature can be close to 4 degrees C. Well, and there are other animals, fishes, which are at the temperature of the water, as you know. Well, if you are an engineer and you say, well, I have to design a system where I can, cho I can choose between something hot and something at room temperature, and I decided to, s to use this thing hot, 37 degrees, okay, your boss said you are fired. Because in terms of uh, energy consumption, it's completely crazy. Completely crazy. Even with, with 40 centimeters of grease. Okay? But it works. Okay? It works. So nature is not really efficient. The point is not the efficiency of nature. Not at all. Here you've got a bat. What is a bat? It was a small mammal 65 million of years um, ago. And there's, there were a modification, genetic modification of three digits there. And then in one million years, it became the only mammal that flies. Well, and it's a great success. Great success. Okay. Pangolin and bats not, but bats alone, it's a great success. But as you probably know, if you go in the tropical areas, you can find bats where the body of the bat is like a cat. Okay? And deciding to do a cat, a flying cat, is not really a good idea in terms of energy consumption. Okay? But it works. Why does it work? Because the bat has a, an area for finding food in three dimensions, because it flies. And no other mammals can do that. So there's a gain of competition. If you have a gain of competition, that, that gives you the ability to be in a place where the others are not. And this is biology. So please, if you are considering biomimicry and say, well, we are going to look at nature because, of course, the solution of the nature is the best. This is completely stupid. No. In the nature, there is something because it's possible. That's all. Okay? And very often, it's not the best solution. It is the solution that finally occurred. Okay? And for the evolution, there's two, uh, two laws for defining what is evolution. The first one is it's not, only, not always the best that win. And the second law is the history is written by the winners. Okay, so you can say, well, nature is absolutely inefficient. If you consider photosynthesis, photosynthesis is 1% of efficiency. 1%? 
we were at 20, 25 persons for us, and here it's one person. What did nature did during hundreds and hundreds of million years for, of improvement? One person. Absolutely nothing. Well, there's a lesson to learn from there. Some of my colleagues are working in PV, photovoltaic, and they say, well, we now reach close to 40% of conversion from the, the heat, the, from the sun. Okay, so it's much, much better than nature. Well, do you have any constraint in terms of element that you take? You do not. Nature has. It has to do with the, with the, the um, chemical elements which are present. Okay? If you just take this constraint and say, well, okay, we are going to do photovoltaic just using organic elements, carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and a few of them. If you do that, then you are here. You see? So the lesson you can learn from that is when you've got a system with a low efficiency, don't consider that the system is bad. First, ask yourself, what are the constraints on this system that gives finally such a low efficiency? Okay? And you see that here with one constraint, that there are many others for a plant. You can cut a leaf and the system uh, still works. If you take a PV panel and you cut a fraction of the PV panel, game is over, okay? Just one constraint, the amount of materials, and then you see that the efficiency goes down. So that's a very, very important lesson. So there's a litany of constraint, physical constraint, historical constraint. Historical constraint is for the whale. The whale is a mammal, so uh, years before it was a mammal with four legs on the earth, okay? And at 37 degrees C. It went to the sea, removed two legs, which is not so difficult, but change inside the engine, it was very difficult. So that's a constraint, historical constraint. Nature's, nature sorry, never goes back, go back, okay? Never, never. And it's the same for different uh, things in our society. There are things that we have today and we never go back. We will never go back. Okay? Constraint of temporality, this is really important for people who are dreaming with innovation. Innovation will save us. Okay. But innovation is not a linear process, nor continuous. There are steps, okay, sometime. And the previous century is unique. All the, all the discovery of the physics with Einstein and other people at the beginning of the last century <coughs> defined it, all what, we, uh, what occurred during this century. Mostly electronics, for example, but same in biology with ADN, <coughs> DNA. Okay? And all of this was a huge amount of innovation. But every century, it is not written that in every century we will have such amount of innovation. Probably not. So people who are just saying that innovation will save us, maybe, not sure. And constraint of uh, boundary condition. I won't talk about that today. I don't have so many time. And there's a point here. Um, is your system adapted or adaptable? You have seen that uh, photosynthesis the efficiency is low, but it's very, very adaptable. You can cut the leaves and so and so. Okay? In comparison, you can imagine the system very, very well adapted, but they are not adaptable. So I won't go into detail with that, but you have to choose. There's a compromise. You cannot get something very, very well adapted, okay, and say, well, this is also adaptable. This is thermodynamic. You can you cannot have both. Imagine, for example, the buildings, okay? Well, they are supposed to have very low energy consumption, but the constraints for the people who live in this building are very, very large, okay? They, are, they, they, are, they should not open the windows and so and so. So their buildings are well adapted, but not adaptable, okay? And this can be developed in ev almost every field. Well, I won't talk too much of that today. What I want to talk about now, <coughs> because I want to leave some time for the... Uh, we do... Okay, we do have some time again. 
Maybe I will go back. Okay. What I want to talk about now it's um, uh, our relation, the relation be between our planet and the sun, and show you that at first we may say, well, it's a very very big engine, so well, we don't really um, change this. In fact, the budget between the sun and our planet is that the sun is something at close to 6,000 degrees and radiates over all the universe and there's a small fraction of this, okay, which is called a solid angle that goes through our planet and our planet diffused by radiation to all the universe. If you consider a planet with no atmosphere, that what see the planet is just the rest of the universe and the rest of the universe is what we call the diffuse, uh, the fond diffus cosmologique, the diffuse, um, what's the word? The, the background. <laughs> and this background is a very, very uh, low temperature. It's 2.7 Kelvin. So it's minus 270, close to that. Well, it's very, very cold. And if you are with a system that has to radiate over a very, very cold thing, then the amount of, en of energy that is going is huge. You can feel that when um, you are outside, when and uh, at, during the night, if there are clouds, usually you are not so cold. If there's no cloud, you feel that you are colder because the, 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 the energy goes easily to the, to the rest of the universe by radiation. Okay, and here, if you do the calculation with a planet with no atmosphere, then you can do the budget, okay, and the result is that the temperature of the planet will be close to minus 20, minus 20, 26, it depends on what hypothesis you took, but the result is here, the water is frozen, then there's no life. So for a planet with life, you need an atmosphere. What is this atmosphere? It's like a curtain over the planet. And then when your planet receives the energy from the sun, it radiates. But what you see is not this 2.7 Kelvin, but a curtain, a given curtain, I would say, at a different temperature, which is close to 250. And at the end, when you do this budget, finally you find an average temperature for the planet which is 15 degrees C. And there, water, in average, except at the pole, of course, but water is liquid. And if water is liquid, then life can uh, exist. Okay? Well, so what is the conclusion? The conclusion is that it's just the existence of this curtain around, okay? Just the existence of this atmosphere Around, the, our, around our planet that give us this average temperature. And this is what we are modifying, okay, with CO2, of course. So you see that the system appears to be very, very, very big. Um, what can we do with that? We are just m microbes compared. No, we are microbes that are just changing this, and this is sufficient to modify the temperature of the, of the planet, okay? Well, now we are go back to thermodynamics because the Earth receives the light of the sun. Well, for a given amount of energy coming from the sun, I can ask myself, there's a certain quantity arriving on the leaves of a, of, of a plant, for example, okay, certain quantity. Does the quality matter here? Well, Let's do an experiment. You take a plant, okay, you put close to the window, and you say, okay, I measure the surface of the plant, I see the amount of energy coming, so here, well, let's say it's 300 watt per meter square, so the surface of the plant is this, so at the end, my plant receives an average, okay, 10, 15 watt. Right. Then I take another plant, okay, and I put uh, in a closed room, dark room, 
And I say, well, I just take a small radiator and I tune the radiator so it gives exactly the same amount of energy, 15 watt, in the dark. In both cases, the amount of energy, the quantity is the same, okay? You leave the system and you come back one week after. First, you see an ice plant, okay, with the development and the structuration of the matter. So this plant has, uh, has taken some CO2 from the air and some nutrients from, from the ground, and then you've, you've got new tissues, new leaves, okay, right? So it's kind of structuration of the matter, and the other one is dead, as you know. So you can see that the quality of the energy is really, really important for life. If you just, just have the amount of energy, it's clearly not sufficient. Okay, this experience, uh, a, children, a, a child of uh, six years old could understand that. So you see that, in fact, thermodynamics is really, really, really important to explain what occurs, especially for the life. Well, and here, it's the trophic chain. Maybe you know that. You've got the light energy. So the energy from the sun is of very, very, very high quality. That's the reason that if you receive energy of very, very high quality, then that gives you the possibility to structure the matter, structure the element, and produce new tissues, okay, new leaves, and so and so. And you see that this is the second law of thermodynamics. If you leave something, uh, then this something will spread energy of matter, a body, whatever, a dead body, okay, then the matter will be spread, okay, into the degrees of freedom, okay. But the law, the second law, tells you also something which is not like a requiem, but more than like a tedium, which is, well, if you receive energy of good quality, so photons from the sun for a plant are good, good food for you, then this is high quality energy, and that gives you the possibility to be structured. This is also the second law of thermodynamics, but from another point of view. Okay? And here you've got light, and here you've got vegetals, and few animals also have photosynthesis, but very, very few. Okay? And these vegetals are very um, important for us. Be why? Because they are, these only can capt capture this energy and use this high quality energy in order to structure the matter, okay, in form of uh, biomass, and then other animals can eat this biomass, and so, and so, and so, and so. So this chain has to do with the quality of the energy, not only with the quantity, okay? Well, now let us consider the industrial revolution. So, more or less, end of the uh, 18th century, okay? What occurred? Well, I take just one, one, one element, let us see for uh, here um, the demography, and we see that the, demogra the demography exploded, okay? When the demography explodes, that's because people can structure their body better. So the amount of high quality energy uh, is um, increasing. Okay, well, but from a biological point of view, really from a biological point of view, what is the difference between the human animal and the other's animal? Well, let us see. The difference is that we became able to use another source of energy. The other animal could not, and they cannot. Okay? So first coal, and later, after the Second, uh, second War, um, oil. Well, if you consider before the Industrial Revolution, all the humans and the rest of the animals were with the same legislation, the same law, which is, you will receive the energy from the sun. Okay? No use of coal, nor, nor gasoline, nor, okay? No fossil. Then, we were all with the same law of, of what? 
the flux of the energy coming from the sun. And the difference in terms of biology for this industrial revolution. What is the difference? Is that our um, community of humans uh, took a gain of competition and this gain of competition is in terms of energy. And if a given uh, species of animal has a gain of competition, the result is that it explodes. Okay? The bat, with the fact that it's the only mammal that can fly, took a great gain of competition and then this uh, developed a lot. So here you can look to the industrial rev revolution just from a biological point of view. You see that? And, well, before it was the flux of the sun, and now it's a stock, okay? Fossil energy, it's not a given flux, it's a stock. We don't care about the flux. If we need more, we take more, okay? That's the main difference. That's really the main difference. So, the problem here is when you are under the condition of a flux, which is mathemat in mathematics is called the Newman condition, then you cannot use more energy than what you receive. But when you are in condition of stock, the amount of the energy you receive just depends on the diameter of the tube you put on the reservoir. Okay? And then you can say, well, I can increase the diameter of the tube and I get a diverging consumption of energy. Exactly what we did. Okay? Let us imagine a story. Imagine that we are whole lions. Okay? And so we want to eat antelopes. Right. Imagine that we are a community of lions under flux condition. That means that you've got an invisible end. So now we, we see where is the invisible end. That gives you one antelope. Okay, in the morning, one in the middle of the day, and one at the end of the day. And every day, one, one, one. Well, then the community of lions will develop and adjust in the perfect matching with the amount of energy coming through this flux of antelopes. Okay, wow. Now imagine, with more imagination, imagine that we are in condition of stock. What does that mean? That you've got a small house, which is the distribution of antelopes, and when you take one antelope, the, the system propels you another antelope, okay? Distribution. Then the stock of antelope, okay, the potential of antelope is constant. What is the consequence? Well, you can take one antelope, two, three, 10, 100, 1,000. Who cares? Who cares? And the result for the lions is that the population will explode, okay? And possibly many lions will be very, very fat too. Everything that we already know, you see? So, that the, st so the stock conditions just explain many things of our, uh, our, our living system today, okay? This is just biology. Very, very simple to see. But the problem is that if you imagine that you will solve this problem just with leg legislation, becomes difficult, becomes difficult, okay? Well, there's a link between energy and matter. Here we are um, 1,000 years uh, ago, okay? Well, in this period, where there were a strong development of the use of the power of the water. In fact, there were one, uh, one system every two kilometers in France. So huge, well, with a very, very strong, strong le legislation. And this system can produce um, uh, the bread at the end of the day, okay? So you've got the energy, you put the resource, okay, from the field, and then you get the bread. And there, linking energy and matter gives a strong development at that time. Okay, you can see if you get to, to, um, to some article, you can see this. Well, what I want to show you here is usually we say, well, uh, when we have a solution for energy, 
well, life was probably better uh, before. Well, here we are in Paris. We are uh, Quai de la Tournelle, so it's not far from Notre Dame. And you can see that here you've got some wood. Where does this wood come? So for all the all, all Paris, okay. Well, it comes from uh, Clamcy. Clamcy is in the center of France. It's 180 kilometers uh, away from Paris. And there in Clamcy, you can see here the river, which is uh, Lyon. And the river is completely full of pieces of wood. So along 200 kilometers, everything's dead, okay, just for the wood for Paris. So when people are talking about external negativities, okay, this is not something new. This is absolutely not something new. Here you can see that the influence of Paris and um, the detrimental uh, consequence of the presence of Paris is really, really important here for the, um, uh, for the wood, for the energy. Um, another thing, this sensation has a name, it's called Coke. Well, okay, when you've got a can of Coke and it's, your can is on the table and you are drinking your can, it's a stock of, of Coca-Cola, okay? You don't touch the can and you don't um, put it in your hand. The can is full until it is empty, right? You drink, you drink, you drink, and once there's no more. But you cannot measure and you cannot say, well, I have to reduce my consumption. This is exactly what we have with the fossil energy. We don't have any idea, or some people do, but it's strategic. But we don't have any feeling, I would say, of what is the level, okay? And this is the problem with the stock. With the flux, you know what is the amount of energy that you receive, okay? With the stock, you do not. So this is really difficult for the political decision then, because we don't feel that, okay? When you are under stock, there are many degrees of freedom. You can change the radius of the tube or whatever you, but there is no feedback. You can consume as uh, the amount you want. When you are under flex conditions, there is no degree of freedom. And the counterpart is that the feedback is very strong. Okay? If you uh, take some wood for the winter, okay, you have your, your wood for the winter and you decide to, to burn more, more wood because you want to be warmed uh, enough, then the drawback, the feedback is very fast. Is that at the end of the winter you don't have any more. Okay? And this is important because for the decision that gives you the possibility of thinking of, okay, what I, wa what I have to do, okay? And the stock condition, there is no such, um, such a reflection. Well, I'm going to finish, I think. Um, you probably, you know this curve. Uh, I took it from the, uh, the website of Jean-Marc, Jean-Marc Jancovici. And this is the relation between the GDP and the oil consumption. Well, some people say, well, GDP is a measurement of nothing. Not really, not really. GDP is a kind of measurement of the amount of transformation of the matter inside a given area. More or less, the activity of, of the people is also the transformation of the matter. And you see that, I know that correlation is not a proof, of course, but, okay, between the transformation of the matter and the amount of energy, more or less there's a relation. And for me, as a physicist, this is completely normal. Completely. Okay? Here we are in 1973 with the oil chalk. Here we are in 1982. And then we start dancing again. Well, as you probably know, the provision for us is to have a slope this way, okay? With increasing the GDP and decreasing the consumption of energy. Well, some people say, well, 
this is physics. I don't care about physics. I need financial estimation. Well, let's do. This is the relation between the GDP and the old price of the barrel. There's absolutely no relation in between. Okay? Once an economist came to the lab and he presented us the L'OCDE, what, what's the word? OECD. Oh, yes. And he came and he explained us uh, how their uh, macro model. And at the end of the, his talk, we asked, okay, well, we could not see energy in your model. The answer was, well, energy, it's just 6% of the amount of money. And the error bar is 10%. So, taking care of energy or not makes no difference. Well, okay. Well, I am in, in my flat and I look to my budget and I say, well, 6%. Oh, water and warming water. Well, it costs me about every month 6% of, of my money. Well, so I decide to remove that. And I look if the result is that my life is changed only by 6%. I have no more water at home. <laughs> and that's the problem. Of course you know that. Of course you know that. The problem is that, hey guy, comes back to physical world. Please, please. Here we are close to the physics. Yeah? Here we are no more. And that's a part of the problem. Okay, I want to conclude now just saying that I, I had the honor to participate to the, the redaction of this, of this book, which is the manual of the Greek transition. So it's like Polanyi too. <laughs> and um, uh, if you want this book in English, it's possible. And if you want this book for free, it's possible. Because in English, it's for free. And in French, you have to buy it. <laughs> so. You'd uh, just uh, ask, uh, ask for my email. I'm not sure where's my, no, my email is. Well, so you send, okay, you send me email and I send you uh, the location where, to, um, where to, to, to get the PDF of this book. Uh, because the traduction, the, the English traduction has been made by the, uh, Oxford University. And it's for free, for free in English. Yes, I will send you I will send you directly the PDF. Okay. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>